Good afternoon, and welcome to what I know will be an interesting and important conversation about affirmative action. I'll start with stating the obvious. I am not Elizabeth Alexander, the president of the Mellon Foundation. Elizabeth, unfortunately, was not able to make it today, and she sends her regrets. My name is Carter Stewart, and I'm the executive vice president over programs. I'd like to start first by inviting everybody on the Zoom to please introduce yourself in the chat. We would like to know who you are, where you're from, and any questions you might have for the panelists. The chat is a wonderful way of generating community questions and discussion. So we hope you will take full advantage. And it is truly my privilege to facilitate this conversation about affirmative action. From its initial implementation in 1960 to its decades of complex history at American universities and colleges and to its possible future as we wait for the Supreme Court to rule on it this spring. Since the Supreme Court first considered affirmative action in 1978, race conscious admissions policies in higher education have remained contentious. They impact institutions such as Harvard and the University of Texas. They inform admissions decisions for students in all 50 states and around the world. They influence ongoing efforts to address racial injustice in American society and get at core questions of fairness and access to a good education. The question of why affirmative action matters is still urgent and still shapes our trajectory as a country. Joining us today for this discussion are our three guest speakers, Sherilyn Eiffel, Stuart Quo, and Melissa Murray. Sherilyn Eiffel is a globally recognized legal scholar who currently serves as senior fellow at the Ford Foundation and is former president and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. She is also a former faculty member at the University of Maryland School of Law and a prominent voice on racial justice in the United States. Stuart Quo is a steadfast champion for educational equity and social justice, dedicating his career to advocating for historically underrepresented and underserved communities. He is the co-founder and co-executive director of the Asian American Education Project and the founder and president emeritus of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Southern California, the largest legal and civil rights organization in the country for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And MacArthur Fellow, he is also a former instructor at UCLA's Asian American Studies Department, UCLA Law School, and the UC Berkeley School of Law. Melissa Murray is an award-winning constitutional law scholar and the Frederick and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at New York University, a former clerk for Justice Sonia Sotomayor when she served on the Second Circuit. Melissa is also a former interim dean of the UC Berkeley School of Law, host of the popular podcast, Strict Scrutiny, and a regular commentator for media outlets, including NPR, CNN, and the New York Times. Sherilyn, Stewart, and Melissa, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'd like to start with a, a basic foundation question so that we're all starting from the same playing field. And that really is the basic question of definition. When we talk about affirmative action in the higher education context, what does that mean? And Sherilyn, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Thank you, Carter. Well, it's been a bit of a sliding scale uh, over the last 50 or so years. Um, what it has come to mean is really race conscious admissions, which is probably the right way to talk about it, certainly in the context of the two cases that are currently before the United States Supreme Court which is whether or not you can give attention to uh, the race of a student and the admissions process. In its earlier incarnations, 
uh, in um, the 1970s and late 1960s, affirmative action was imagined as a set of affirmative actions, efforts, steps by uh, universities, and of course it exists outside the university context as well, to um, essentially make up for or begin the process of writing what had been uh, hundreds of years of affirmative action for white people. And that is to take particular and and, um, identifiable steps to ensure that um, black applicants were included um, among admissions in um, institutions of higher learning from which they had been excluded some by de, de jure uh, discrimination in the South, but also by de facto discrimination in the North. And so the idea was to bring greater uh, opportunity uh, to young black students, to give them the opportunity to um, be admitted to universities that had traditionally excluded them, again, either by law or just by practice, Uh, and therefore to create a set of admissions practices that allowed you to um, specifically identify a set of students that you wanted to bring into the class. Uh, In its earlier years, uh, there were set asides, a a certain number of positions uh, each year that um, schools might identify for um, racial minorities, for black students or for Latino students. Um, And, the the admissions you know practice would be that we want to admit you know imagining it's a smaller school ten or twenty black students a year. Um, the Supreme Court made clear in the 1979 Baki case that um, it regarded those uh, efforts, those affirmative action efforts, as unconstitutional. That creating actually hard quotas or set asides for a particular race, um, the court said, violates the 14th Amendment. Um, The court did leave open the possibility of considering race and admissions, um, (laughs) interestingly, in order to protect the university's First Amendment right to make its own decisions about the kind of educational environment it wishes to create. And so essentially the Baki decision, um, I was a senior in high school and we regarded it as a terrible blow and saw it as a loss. Um, And it was a loss because it rejected out of hand um, as a rationale for race conscious admissions, the whole reason that affirmative action had been created, which was to right a grievous wrong, uh, which was to try and fix and to provide recompense to a kind of um, structural form of discrimination that had happened at some of our nation's finest institutions, but also at state institutions and others as well. Um, And the whole idea was that we could not just end discrimination, but that we had to address um, the barriers and the inequities and the disparities that uh, were the result of that discrimination. That was the idea of affirmative action. You've all heard the, you know, the old saw that, you know, you can't hold someone back and then and then uh, decide that, you know, you can start the race and they both start running. But one is hobbled in one leg. Um, You have to actually take action that are going to level the playing field. So that was the original idea. That was rejected in Baki. And instead, what Baki did was issue a decision that recognized the rights of universities rather than um, uh, the the broader equal protection rights of of black students. Of course, black students were not parties in the Baki case. Um, And in fact, in in most of the affirmative action cases, there were no uh, black students or alumni who were parties really until the Grutter case a bit uh, and the Harvard case. These are cases that have been fought principally between white students and now more recently an organization purporting to represent Asian American students and um, predominantly white universities. Uh, So what it now has meant, so as I said, Baki was considered a loss in 1979, a a terrible blow. And, uh, but it became, you know, the, the, the opinion that, that, lifted up the right of the university to create a diverse environment became the lifeline. And so we litigated and we um, moved from that point and universities began to create uh, narrowly tailored programs that would allow them to consider race in a way that would ensure they had a diverse class in order to meet their educational objective 
to ensure that students had an opportunity to interact with lots of different kinds of students and be exposed to new ideas and experiences. And yet, even that modest form of race conscious admissions has been challenged over and over again. And every time it's been challenged, uh, in the Grutter case, um, in the Fisher case twice, um, it has survived. Um, and yet, those who oppose affirmative action like their chances, and they really like their chances with this Supreme Court. And so we are back here once again. Um, and now the claim has been altered um, to suggest that um, race conscious admissions actually harms Asian American students. And so the claims purport to be brought on behalf of Asian American students rather than on behalf of white students, which had been the form of these cases uh, through Fisher, so through 2016. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherilyn. Uh, Stuart and Melissa, would you like to add anything to, to that definition that we just heard in that background? I think Cheryl, Sherilyn gave a very comprehensive answer that, again, dates all the way back to the executive action programs from the 1960s and 1970s. I'd simply add that you know, what the Bakke case does that is so important here is to eliminate the prospect that repair or remedy should be an underlying ethos of affirmative action pro programs. And that becomes concretized in 1989 in another case involving affirmative action and employment, J.R. Croson versus the city of Richmond. The court really closes the door to the prospect of affirmative action undertaken for remedial efforts. And so that really does leave diversity as the only compelling justification that would support the state's use of race in admissions or employment decisions. And, you know, when you think about it in those terms, it really, again, turns the lever from a question of redistribution of resources that historically had been set aside for certain groups and excluded to others and really does make it about improving the educational experience for a majority of students. And that majority of students is often white students. So again, the interests of the university and more particularly the interests of white students being prioritized. Gotcha. Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, comment on um, uh, Sherilyn's um, commentary, which I thought was excellent. And uh, before I do that, I want to thank the Andrew Mellon Foundation for hosting today. And uh, I I have appreciated the wonderful work that your foundation has been doing. Um, <clears throat> let me get one thing clear. 69% of Asian Americans uh, in polls, even as of 2022, support affirmative action, 69%. So what has happened is the opponents of affirmative action uh, had white uh, opponents, and that didn't work. So that they looked around and they tried to find a uh, another group, and they found a small group of Asian Americans to do this uh, wedge wedge building work, and that's that's really the story that we would like to push forward because. Asian Americans benefit from affirmative action. In the Harvard case, we asked, we did a um, um, a, a memo, and the judge looked at the uh, facts, found that Asian American students actually benefited from the Harvard affirmative action uh, program, and uh, throughout uh, the country. Uh, Asian Americans are benefiting from affirmative action because we we strongly believe in race conscious admissions. Uh, we believe that um, understanding a holistic picture of the whole student uh, brings forward and allows you to um, humanize what is sometimes a dehumanizing story. And so uh, we we really appreciate that. Um, incidentally, <clears throat> we have found that there's been a number of groups who um, <clears throat> were not that strong on affirmative action, but because of the wedge group uh, actions by the plaintiffs in the Harvard case, 
uh, they've come around to support race conscious student admissions. So in, in, a, in a specific sense, uh, the, this work has backfired, but obviously uh, with the current Supreme Court, uh, all bets are off. Great. Thank you so much, Stuart. And you, you raised an incredibly important point about competition within or among racial groups that I want to come back to. But first, I'd actually like to honor your history. You were in college classrooms around the time that affirmative action began. And so through the course of your career, you have seen from an almost pre-affirmative action time to a current affirmative action time. And I was just wondering if you would share what impact affirmative action has had based on your own experience and your own observations? Well, uh, two, two uh, responses. One is um, I was in the UCLA class of uh, a graduate in 1974 and uh, half of this, the students came in through uh, an affirmative action program, including myself, and half came in through regular admissions. I would say that those of us who came in through uh, the special admissions did better in the grades than those who didn't. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't think uh, admissions policies reflect the whole student, and they don't reflect how students will do. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out, uh, just as um, in the last two years, Asian Americans have been um, frightened, beaten, uh, killed throughout the United States in the number of over 11,000 hate incidents. And so that has added a different dimension to the race conscious admissions because some people get confused. They think that because of the hate crimes that the um, admissions can be changed. Uh, so <clears throat> I think that we need to take a holistic view of what is happening in our society. Because if you just look at one aspect, uh, you, you won't, you won't uh, solve it. And I think um, my sense is that there's more Asian American groups now um, in 2023 who support uh, Black students' rights than ever before. And I think that's a good thing. And w depending on what the Supreme Court does, uh, that has to be actual actualized. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Sherilyn, you you mentioned the multiple challenges that affirmative action has experienced. And I, I want to refer to one of them, which is the 2003 Bruder versus Bollinger decision in which Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor famously said, 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. So I'm should, my question should, is, should no longer should no longer should, be should, necessary. should no longer be necessary. Sitting in 2023, if you were able to respond to Justice O'Connor, what what would you say to her at this point? Well, I would say uh, I, I it's it's interesting how people um, how attracted people are to math um, to solve uh, complicated uh, social and political problems. I always understood Justice O'Connor's statement to be a challenge to be a challenge that if we were able to address the um, enormous disparities and gaps in educational achievement in K through 12. In other words, if we move forward on the process of moving towards greater racial equity and justice, we shouldn't in 25 years need mm -hmm. affirmative action. That's what I took her to be saying. I don't think anyone would disagree with the idea that we have not achieved that. I don't think even the um, attorney for the plaintiffs would say we had achieved greater racial equity and, and uh, in, in K through 12 uh, and across the board in this country. So I, 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 I don't, I'm, I'm very um, un, 
impressed <laughs> by those who have said, well, the 25 years is up next year. Let's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, Justice O'Connor would agree with us. I understood that to be the kind of surmising that you do about the future. You know, when I was a girl in elementary school, um, I used to do the calculations of how old I would be in the year 2000. And at that point, I thought, you know, we would, I would, you know, we'd be living on another planet. And, you know, I had all kinds of <laughs> dreams about what it might look like. Um, and, you know, I think it's perfectly fine for her to have presented an optimistic view of where we would be. But it was not, um, I would not call it a holding of that case, that affirmative action is legal for 25 years. Um, it was amusing of Justice O'Connor that tried to imagine a future in which we would not need it. And if I could say one other thing about this, Carter, that really goes back to what Stuart was describing, and I want to really acknowledge Stuart and Asian Americans advancing justice for the kind of um, clarity and courage they have shown through this whole process. Um, one of the most grotesque aspects of what we are uh, dealing with right now is what Stuart calls the wedge issue. And it's not the first time. In 1927, um, a, a set of parents of, a, of, a, of an elementary school girl uh, named Martha Rice brought suit in Mississippi to um, have their daughter admitted to the white school. This is the period of harsh racial segregation. And um, Martha Rice's parents, like every parent, wanted the best education for their child. Uh, and so they wanted her admitted to the school that actually was close to them and um, also was an, a far superior school in terms of resources and building and so on and so forth. This is 1927. And the Supreme Court says, no, no, I'm, you know, when they say colored schools, um, this Chinese American girl will be considered colored and she can go to the black school. Um, so this push and pull, right, of how you um, classify different groups, you know, starting with anti-black white supremacy and then deciding who you're going to lump in to that category has been the shameful project um, of this country for some time. And in this particular case, we should be very clear that uh, although Ed Blum, who is the man who has been behind the most recent affirmative action case is certainly the Fisher case in this case, and also, by the way, the voting rights Shelby County versus Holder case, did not just himself come up with the idea of having Asian American plaintiffs. He drew it from uh, lines in um, the dissenting opinions in Fisher of Justice Alito and of Justice Thomas, who surmised without evidence that Asian Americans might be harmed by affirmative action. And uh, Ed Blum can be heard on a videotape in a uh, talk before the Houston uh, Chinese Alliance saying uh, a, a year later, so I knew I needed to find some Chinese, some Asian plaintiffs. That's how he described it. So he was on a, on the lookout for creating what he thought would be um, a more effective way of challenging affirmative action based on tracing the crumbs, the breadcrumbs that had been left for him by Justices Alito uh, and Thomas. And that's what makes this project, in, in my view, um, really quite sinister. Yeah. So the, the point you just made, uh, Sherilyn, and that you originated, Stuart, of this competition and this this clash among racial groups begs the question of what, what can be done about it? How, how do you mitigate the, the situation that you're describing where one group feels threatened or somehow uh, feels like they they have to separate from what otherwise might be a beautiful racial coalition. Stuart, well, I I'll think start with you. I, Let's do it, please. I definitely think that uh, we have to do a better job at organizing and organizing our communities, informing them. Uh, as you mentioned, I have started a group called the Asian American Education Project. And I asked uh, our trainers, we have uh, 10 trainers. I said, who was the first non-Chinese who stood up for the Chinese and spoke out for them? It happened to be Frederick Douglass mm -hmm. in 1869, mm -hmm. who spoke eloquently mm -hmm. and passionately uh, for the rights of Chinese to be able to come to the United States to be able to become citizens of the United States and to be able to become uh, voters in the United States. <clears throat> People never understand the linkages 
between Blacks and Asians, between Latinx and Asians. Uh, there's a rich history of our uh, coming together. And I just think that that has to be uh, get brought into the schools. Our goal is to reach a million American uh, youth in the next seven years. And that, to me, is one way, a powerful way to um, bring us together. But th there will be many um, <clears throat> cases where uh, Blacks, Latinx, Asians will come together to fight against uh, what, what may come down. So that that is going to be an awfully uh, taxing um, road because we don't know uh, if we can if we can succeed. Yeah, I agree with Stuart. I think education is key, and not just of young people. I think most adults in our respective communities don't know that history of connection and alliance. Um, John, you and I did a program together, Washington Post Live last year, and it's, it remains the, the single um, program that I get um, people asking me about um, because it was at the, the height of, you know, the, the, the most egregious and violent attacks on um, Asians and Asian Americans in the country. And John and I decided to do this program together to really talk about our communities. And it, what came out of it was, it was an incredibly, I think, beautiful um, and informative uh, program with lots of history, but uh, it was how much people in our respective communities, you know, Black and, and Asian and Asian American people reaching out to he and I afterwards who did not know about those connections. There are people who don't know that, you know, when we, we lost Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the, the, you know, there were three, there are three boroughs in New York that used to be covered by the preclearance requirements. And one of them um, was the borough of Manhattan, it, largely because of the Chinese and Chinese American community there. In Chinatown, uh, and that there have been continuous voting rights actions on behalf of the Asian American community in Manhattan uh, who have not received the um, language assistance and language translated materials that the Voting Rights Act requires. So we think about the Voting Rights Act as being the statute that's about enfranchising Black people, but it also is a statute that enfranchises uh, Latin American people, Latinx people, and Asian American people. Um, because of the 1975 um, language minority amendments to the act. So here is what we considered the most successful civil rights statute. And somehow our communities don't really see it as being a statute that um, is very powerful and important for political participation for the Asian American community as well. So I think it's important for that history to be known. So education is one piece, but the second piece is it's white supremacy. It's white supremacy that tells the rest of us that here is your section and these are the spoils you have to divide up among yourselves and fight over. The fact that 43% of students admitted to Harvard are athletes, legacy admits, donor admits, or children of faculty and other um, employees at the, at, the, at the school somehow is not the issue. 43%. So we just take that off the top and then we're all scrabbling for the rest. So that's what white supremacy does. That's what it did in the Gong Lung case. It made the parents of Martha Lum feel that they had to classify their child as white just to be able to get a quality education for her. So yes, it is education, but in my view, first and foremost, it is ending white supremacy and challenging white supremacy, which creates this false competition between us. If I could add one short story to sure. what um, uh, Sherilyn was talking about. Um, when uh, the uh, Martin Luther King holidays started, uh, we used to have a press conference to celebrate it. And I remember, this is in this, uh, probably the 70s, uh, a young Chinese uh, reporter came up to me and said, why should we celebrate this? Uh, what does it mean to us? And I said, when did you come into the United States? Uh, when did your family come into the United States? He said, oh, 1970. I said, but for the Black-led civil rights movement, you wouldn't be here today. It's because of the 1965 civil rights um, immigration changes 
that led to the wholesale change of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States of America. But for the Black-led civil rights movement, that wouldn't have happened. I, I studied the congressional record, and it was all about civil rights. And that led to the, the 1965 immigration law changes. Um, at that time, uh, there may have been 3 million Asian Americans in the United States. Today, there's over 23 million, uh, largely because of immigration. But the, mm -hmm. the point I want to add is that how would Asian Americans know about this? When they, when they apply for immigration, they are not taught Asian American history. They are not taught Black history. They are not taught uh, Latinx history. So we have our, a lot of work to do because we cannot assume, even in our own communities, that there's knowledge of how we've worked together and how we've succeeded together. I think it's tremendously powerful stories that we need to spread to our youth. Uh, we're working with the SEIU. We're working with the uh, UFT in New York. We're working with unions and uh, community organizations throughout the United States. We have to get that sto those stories out. Yeah, no, at, at Mellon, we believe in the power of the humanities and history and stories. So everything you just said really resonates, Stuart. Melissa, I'd like to ask you a similar question, but a, a question that goes beyond race in the sense that we live in highly intense times when it comes to college admissions. I have three kids who have gone through or are going through the process totally different than when I went through it in terms of the level of anxiety fear and, and, and across the country, there's worry that uh, the next generation won't do as well as the last generation. So many more applications going to the, the uh, most selective schools. How do you convince parents and the public that this isn't a zero sum game, that if your child gets in, my child doesn't, how, how do you uh, prevent that, that type of mentality from pervading public discourse? You know, Carter, if I had the answer to that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on a beach somewhere on overviewing, looking over my own view that I'd purchased because I would have solved everything. I mean, that really is the million dollar question. All of this furor over college admissions is really fueled by this tremendous anxiety that we are a backsliding nation economically in terms of our growth. But it also, I think, is fueled, and this goes to something that Sherilyn said, that particular sectors of the American populace understand this backsliding to be pushing them further and further away from what they might rightly deserve or would have been entitled to at an earlier time in our history. And so, again, it is a question of this sense of anxiety about backsliding and recession to some degree, but it's also about a sense of entitlement about where you should be in the society and who should be around you in those positions that you believe are yours to enjoy. And, you know, I don't know that everyone will necessarily cop to that. I mean, I do think it takes a fair bit of self-awareness to understand your anxieties as stemming from a sense of entitlement and even grievance. But I do think that is part of it. I think we see it in the student loan cases that were argued before the court the other day about the student loan forgiveness. I mean, we had Chief Justice Roberts making a lot of the idea that people who go to college, these individuals who rack up college or university student debt are making a choice and they don't get the kind of largesse that um, individuals who start their own businesses do. So why should student loans be forgiven when loans to start a business are not? Um, and again, thinking about who he has in mind, the student, the face of student loan forgiveness is largely black and brown students, low income black and brown students the face of the ostensible lawn care business owner that the chief justice is thinking of is 
probably a white man who has foregone college and instead has cast out on his own. And, you know, there's a lot to say about that, um, including the fact that people who own small businesses had certain forms of targeted relief directed at small business owners during COVID and the fact that small business loan debts can be dischargeable in bankruptcy. That is not the same for those who borrow on behalf of their educations. But underlying all of it, I think, is a sense that certain people who at an earlier age would have understood themselves to be at the top of the pecking order find themselves perhaps slipping. And we hear this a lot, union jobs that don't pay the same or that have been cast aside and put overseas or individuals who rightly would have been at the top of the heap in the college being cast out in favor of these undeserving minorities. That I think is at the bottom of all of this. And so I think if we are going to be really serious about tackling this question, it's not just about the anxiety about what college can do. It is about the anxiety that white supremacy produces. Mm -hmm. And if I could stay with you, Melissa, for another question related to what you just said, there are some folks who think that this whole conversation about affirmative action is only for elites and elite schools, that uh, there's a, a small number of select colleges. Most of them have open admissions or not as selective. So this affirmative action issue does not impact other colleges and universities that are non-selective. And I, I wonder what your response would be to that viewpoint. So certainly the face of this right now is Harvard and UNC. Um, UNC is famously known as a public ivy. I went to the University of Virginia, so I dispute that rigorously. Um, but leaving that to the side for a moment, um, there are so many different ways in which in the operation of an institution of higher education that you think about race, that you think about protected characteristics like gender or sexual orientation and race in organizing and indeed operating your institution. I was the dean of Berkeley Law for 17 months. And we thought a lot about this, not just in the admissions calculus, but in other places. Um, and again, Berkeley operated under a constitutional, a state constitutional amendment that prohibited the consideration of race in hiring an admissions decision, but was more unclear about whether race could be considered in the way you put together your class. And indeed, most law schools, I think, in California, when they were thinking about organizing their classes, would try and sprinkle out the minority students across the various sections so that there would be representation and quote unquote diversity in each section. Um, that ostensibly like, could be on the table going forward. So, I mean, I think we are focused on the admissions decision and the point of entry and recruitment and possibly even in hiring for employment. But this question of how race is used is going to impact the operation of all higher education institutions because they are all thinking about race in particular ways. If it's in the administration of scholarship money, if it's in the way they host affinity groups for various student groups, all of this is on the table. And so this case, UNC, the Harvard case, will answer one facet of that question about admissions. It will not answer these other questions. And so what we need to be prepared for is another 20 years of litigation about these other topics. That's right. I, I, I agree. The, um, <clears throat> the race conscious admissions is one aspect of affirmative action, but the larger um, picture is that affirmative action uh, helps people it, when they get to the, in the workplace. Uh, and <clears throat> is that going to be threatened as well? And uh, as you said, there could be decades of litigation. I just want to add one uh, last point that I think that um, this discussion um, is really about multiracial democracy. If, there, if different groups have no access to our educational system, especially our higher educational system, if they have no access, uh, how does that picture multiracial democracy in the United States in 2023? It's not a very good picture. And it re really requires us to double down to really try to find different ways to unite 
uh, different ways to work together, uh, different ways um, to figure things out. Um, <clears throat> if the if the Supreme Court abolishes uh, affirmative action dealing with race conscious admissions, uh, we have to find different alternatives uh, that bring about the uh, possibility for the, those black students or those minority students to have an opportunity. Otherwise, we, the, the idea of that we're, we're, we're promoting throughout the world right now that we're the shining multiracial democracy is a farce. We, we have to do something much better for our people. Otherwise, um, it, it, it becomes a really a farce. Great. Thank you, Stuart. And we, we've been focused a lot, uh, actually, mainly on Carter, the... Carter, Carter, oh, sorry, go ahead. Carter, can I just respond to, to both Melissa and, sure. and, and Stuart? Um, because when I heard Melissa, and um, it makes me so sad to say, it sounded even optimistic to imagine we had 20 years of litigation. Um, I did not but, mean to be optimistic. Sure. You're probably I would, I would right. normally never say this about you, but <laughs> but um, but I think you know we're we're in an ecosystem in which they're feeding off of each other, right? Mm. And the and and in the political realm, they can almost they can be much more blatant and explicit. So I think when we see what DeSantis, Governor DeSantis in Florida, has on offer, right, which is about you know ending affinity houses on campus and um. Uh, you know, and their questions about, you know, black sororities and fraternities. And I, I don't think that this decision, if the court is so bold as to, to strike down race conscious admissions, I do not believe that this decision will be contained. Uh, and I don't think it's going to take litigation for the rest of the dominoes to fall. You know, I think they're going to start to fall out of fear that, you know, universities and workplaces will become afraid. We can see it in the corporate response. Look at the number of corporations signed on to amicus briefs in the affirmative action case cases in Grutter, in Fisher, and now in the Harvard case. And they're going like this because even the business community is afraid to stick its head above water. And so um, we see what, what uh, Governor DeSantis did with Disney has frightened uh, corporate America. And so they are not taking the kind of bold stand we would expect them to take. Look at what just happened with the Silicon Valley Bank and the um, uh, grotesque allegation that having one black board member somehow is the reason why this bank failed. I thought I would hear a concerted pushback from the business community that just two and a half years ago you know, pledged itself to be all about racial justice. Um, mm -hmm. So I just think we should be take a very, very clear-eyed view of what a negative decision from the Supreme Court may mean. I think things will unravel quite quickly. And so therefore I think Stewart's point about um, this being a democracy question is absolutely on point. Uh, and what the, the challenge we have is that we have a large number, tens of millions of Americans who we now have pushed themselves to the point that they are no longer um, wedded to the project of democracy. Right. Mm. It's one thing to be brought into the project of democracy, but think you're going to be at the top. <laughs> it's a whole nother thing mm -hmm. to say, well, whether we're not a democracy or not, you know, I'm agnostic about it. Um, so long as I get what I want. Uh, and that's, I think, where we are. And that's why we're in a scarier position. And this decision will not stand alone uh, because there are these other forces that are even more aggressive that are uh, that are pushing on this whole area as well. I will just clarify, I'm not trying to be the Pollyanna here and think like we will have 20 more years to sort of hash this out. Um, I think even if the court writes a very limited decision, and to be very clear, the court is overruling affirmative action. Gruder is getting overruled. Like I will say it here, I will stake my, uh, you can bet money on it and I'll take you out to dinner, Sherilyn, if I'm wrong. Um, but the court is overruling this. I think the question is they're not going to go beyond the question presented, but will write it 
in a way that is opaque enough that will have a deterrent effect on other uses of race or certainly will call into question whether race can be used in other places. And that may spur litigation, or as you say, Cheryl, and I think this is exactly right, it will simply have a chilling effect on all of these things entirely. Yeah. And Sherilyn, you anticipated my question that's connected to everything that you all have been talking about, which is there's the, the court battle inside the legal court, but there's also the court of public opinion. And in the court of public opinion, as you said, Sherilyn, there's some folks who are, are not convincible, but then there, there's also a large section of the country that is. But what I'm picking up from you is that you feel like that, that battle over the, in the court of public opinion is being lost. And that's and I'm, so my question is, is, is that right? And is that my take on what you're saying? And if so, why? Why is that battle in the court of public opinion uh, losing one so far? Well, I don't think we're losing the battle of, for demo, for, of allegiance to democracy in the court of public opinion. I just think that the people who are um, either opposed to or agnostic about whether or not we are a democracy are quite energized. Yeah, and, I'm sorry, I didn't um, mean democracy. I meant affirmative action, but the court of public affirmative opinion. Affirmative action. Oh, okay. Action. Yeah. yeah. No, I, th you know, look, I would tell you, Carter, I would have thought that, um, you know, the evidence that was, that was developed in the Harvard case in particular would have produced a different kind of response. I think that learning that 43% of the seats are set aside for ALDS, for athletes and legacies and, you know, donor connected folks and faculty affiliated applicants. I would have thought people would be like running up Harvard Square with, you know, with torches and 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 pikes. Um, and yet that hasn't produced that reaction. I mean, I think there are many people who've noticed it, but I think it's so it, it's such a shocking revelation, I, at least I thought. Uh, and it's re received a kind of ho-hum response. I also think I would say that um, due to the the strong, united voice and alliance, between the Asian American and the African American community on this case, we've actually done a pretty damn good job um, of, of debunking the idea that this competition is real. Um, first of all, the facts in the Harvard case don't bear it out. So, and, and they were quite rigorous, rigorously developed. But I think that, um, you know, the, the, if you look at the case itself, the trial itself, uh, there were no Asian American students who testified that affirmative action is harming us and that we want it to go away and that we don't care about diversity. There were a number of Asian American students testifying that we support race conscious admissions and that diversity is incredibly important to us and that I would feel harmed myself if I couldn't talk about my experience as a Vietnamese immigrant in my es essay, if I couldn't talk about how translating and be being the advocate for my Chinese parents who don't speak English um, developed my social justice vision, right? That it matters to us to be able to identify ourselves uh, and so I think that the, the actual case itself did not, I think they thought they would be able to do it all on atmospherics, but I actually think that um, not only just the plaintiffs within the confines of the case, but because of that unity that existed between um, the communities, we, we actually were able to undercut a lot of the damage that I think they had hoped they would do with this wedge issue. So I feel actually quite good about, about that. And I do think people understand and recognize the importance of race conscious admissions, in part because this case is coming amidst this much more explicit racist retrenchment that is happening in the political spaces um, around the country. And I think, you know, if, if this were standing alone, then it seems kind of like a niche, delicate racial issue. But when you see it in the context of what is happening around the country, at both the state level uh, and you know, at the national level in terms of the former administration and so forth, you understand that there's a bigger project. And I think that has allowed there to be um, less, less uh, attrition than might have otherwise happened had this case been kind of a standalone like it was in Fisher. Um, this, this really comes amiss Trump and his EEO and, you know, and DeSantis and, 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 and Abbott and voter suppression and all the things that are the atmospherics around this that um, with which it is of a piece? Okay. Thank you, Stuart and Melissa. Do you want to come on on that? Yes. Well, <clears throat> I think that um, in the Harvard case, we uh, like 
like uh, Sherilyn said, we did the um, uh, amicus um, brief, and it really showed uh, the students really showed that they had come from a hard uh, life growing up in Chinatown. Uh, they had grown up and in uh, difficult circumstances, and so it really was a, um, I think, an eye opener uh, for even the judge. Mm -hmm. But I, I do want to go back to the thought of how we build the race conscious um, thinking. Uh, if the Supreme Court, as Melissa said, uh, turns away from uh, justice. And so I think that there has to be a response from foundations, uh, from community organizations, from unions. Uh, there has to be a response to support justice and support our multicultural, multiracial democracy. If we don't have that response, then the other side can claim victory. Uh, so I really think we have to think of different ways to respond to this because um, it's not going to go away uh, with one case. It's not going to go away. Um, but the, the future of the country is actually at stake. And that has to be brought out because otherwise uh, we, we all lose. And could you add, I'm, 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 Melissa, I'll turn to you, in addition to the, the threat to multiracial democracy, all, all of you have taught in public institutions with diverse student bodies. Can you talk about some of the other benefits that are, are tangible benefits from the, the diversity that you've seen in your classroom that are also at risk if affirmative action is, is, you know, is gone, as you suggested? Well, I just... I, I just uh, will finish the story about UCLA. There's tremendous um, benefits uh, from having um, diverse students uh, conversing, uh, working together, arguing together, um, looking at issues together. Uh, and then the relationships that are built will last forever. Uh, I can't tell you how many um, friends who are Black and uh, Latinx and other uh, otherwise uh, who came together because of affirmative action, but they left as true friends who help each other, who work together. Um, that is a tremendous uh, benefit to to affirmative action that people. Um, once you get into school, you could see it, but it's the outsiders who claim um, that it it divides us. It actually unites us. Thank you, Stuart. And Melissa? So California schools um, basically entered the post-affirmative action age in the 1990s um, with the adoption of Proposition 209, which was a voter referendum in California that eliminated the use of race in higher education admissions, indeed any public school admissions and in employment decisions. And so the University of California, Berkeley, where I was a faculty member and eventually interim dean for 17 months, I was there for 12 years as a faculty member, was essentially operating under this uh, legal landscape for the entire time that I was there. And it was actually really interesting. Um, you would think, and the logic that many conservatives tout about affirmative action is that it removes the kind of taint of stigma from minority students who are admitted. And I just did not find that to be the case. And I don't think that my students felt that that was the case. I think many of them who are Black or Brown still felt that they were being looked at as though they didn't belong there, even though as a formal matter, race was not a question in their admissions decision. So, you know, I mean, leaving that to the side, as Sherilyn had said, the power of white supremacy is powerful. It is actually powerful and it can transcend even ostensibly race neutral environments. I will also say that 
we had very few Black students. Um, we, we managed to get to a critical mass of Asian students, a critical mass of Latinx students. It was always very difficult to recruit African-American students um, to Berkeley, to even get them to apply to Berkeley. Um, we often went to HBCUs, undergraduate institutions, to recruit. Those are principally in the South, um, and many of the students are from the South. And so making the leap to come to California was often more than many of them wanted to undertake. They wanted to stay closer to home. And, you know, so we had a difficult time. And when you're trying to sort of have conversations in a law school about criminal justice, about constitutional law, and you're in a class where there's one or two Black students, because for much of my time there, they were sort of sprinkled out across sections to ensure that there was some representation in each section. I think you really risk that students find themselves, unfortunately, in the position of being spokespersons for the race. And you lose the notion that even within racial groups, there is considerable nuance and diversity of views. You know? And so, you know, I, I wrote an op-ed after Justice Jackson was appointed to the court that this was the first time we'd had two Black justices on the court. And they could not be more different in terms of their ideological bent. And that was something I thought that America needed to see, that even within the Black community, these issues were not monolithic. And they could cut in lots of different ways, even as the people holding those views shared the same racial background. Like they are from different generations, Justice Thomas and Justice Jackson. Um, they have very different perspectives on affirmative action as we are seeing and as we will see when this case is decided. But that kind of nuance is utterly flattened when you just don't have the numbers. Mm -hmm. you, oh, I was wondering, I just was wondering when you, when you were talked about, you know, going to HBCUs, you know, is that the kind of thing that will be chilled? Not that you can go at all, but let's suppose you really emphasize that, right? Because a lot of what people have said as well, you know, increase the pipeline to bring Black yeah. students in. So Please. now you, you you have your missions calendar and you say, we're going to go, you know, we're going to go three times to, you know, to Spelman and Morehouse. And we're going to go to Howard three yeah. times and Harvard once. I, I don't know. I mean, that's an open question going forward. And there is a very telling exchange between Patrick Strawbridge, who argued this case on behalf of students for fair admissions, um, and one of, the, I think it was Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh asked him, could you have a scholarship that was not based on race, but rather was reserved for the descendants of slaves? Mm -hmm. And Patrick Strawbridge was like, no, no, can't have that. Slavery is too closely correlated with race. And it's like, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. You are as are so many other things, which is the I, point. I, yeah. that, I mean, I don't even I mean was, I don't what it galaxy was astonishing. Brain. It was utterly yeah. galaxy brain insanity, but that's exactly why we have these kinds of programs because slavery was correlated mm -hmm. with race. And so this is just going to lead to a lot of questions. I don't know. I mean, like I, I think the point of this is we are leading to a landscape where institutions of higher education cannot approach students of color at all. And I think that is the point. Yeah. So we, we have a whole lot of wonderful audience questions that I want to turn to in just a minute, but I want to finish with a question to each of you, building, Melissa, on what you were talking about, uh, but uh, in terms of the UC system, but hopefully in a, in a different light, meaning that when folks talk about situations where there is disruption, or destruction, there can also be opportunity for rebuild, rebirth, rebuilding, doing, creating things from new that that move in a better direction. So, looking at this as from as optimistically a, a place as possible, what what is the path forward if affirmative action ends? What what do you see or hope for uh, in the aftermath? So. I will be very honest with you. I'm not the right person to take an optimistic slant on this. I will say that we managed to do amazing things at Berkeley, but we did so in a posture of complete incapacitation, right? I mean, like it would have been so much easier and we would have been able to do so much more if we could have thought about race in a conscious, clear-eyed way. And instead, you know, we were doing a lot of things that I think flattened the student experience. I mean, we could consider class and socioeconomic status, but that essentially meant reducing every student of color, if you thought about them in that way, as someone who was necessarily impoverished. I, again, I think that 
loses some of the nuance and again, isn't really a holistic presentation of the population that you're seeking to attract, right? I mean, again, and, and I, I think Justice Jackson really brought this home. Why shouldn't you be able in the admissions process to talk about what has shaped the development of yourself as a person? And if that's race, talk about that. If it's class, talk about that. If it's race and class together, talk about those things. Why is that off the table? And why can't a school consider that in trying to think about how you would contribute to the overall environment in the classroom. That's exactly what Bruder talked about, this holistic inquiry where nothing was determinative because we were thinking about these candidates as whole people. And so, yes, we did our best. And I think we eventually got to a place where through a lot of Herculean efforts, we were able to recruit Black and brown students in greater numbers than we had in the immediate aftermath of 209. But it shouldn't have had to be that hard. And it was a blow to the education that those students received while we tried to do it. And we could have had a more holistic, a more robust educational experience, a true exchange of ideas if we had been, I think, able to consider those other factors that were prohibited. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Sherilyn or Stuart, same same question to you all. Is there a path forward that? Well, uh, I, you know, I take I take my optimism in a, in a bit of a of a different way. Um, in that, you know, we are in a very very challenging period in this country. Um, you know that some have likened to the the Nadir or the Nader. You know the period in the early 20th century that was such a devastating period for Black people in this country, and um, and so I've spent a lot of time looking at what did we do during that period. You know because uh, I know most people think that Plessy was decided in 1896, and then and then we just um, you know put our heads down and were lynched, and then it was 1954 that you know people were fighting. Um, people were fighting for equality and justice all through that period and a lot of different ways. There was lots of litigation. There was the effort to create, you know, unions and cooperatives. And there was the creation and strengthening of institutions. Um, so I think that HBCUs, um, particularly the HBCU um, infrastructure in, you know, D.C. and and, um, and Georgia and other places will expand. It would not surprise me to see those schools exponentially increase in size um, and and in some measure because you know black students I think will will decrease their applications to um, uh, white institutions um, so I think that will happen and I think we'll have to spend more time thinking about you know HBCUs are actually quite diverse um, and to think about how to be intentional about that um, I think we will have to think about um, what it will mean for the American university system and for the humanities and um, and think about, you know, what we are developing, um, particularly in American high schools um, as a place of reaching students. And so that they are having that fundamental foundational democratic training that Stuart is talking about. Um, I, I think we're just going to have to pivot to other places where we can, um, you know, inculcate the values of, of, of a multiracial democracy and work intensely in those, those spaces. It doesn't mean that we give up the ghost in um, majority white uni universities. I think we do all the things that Melissa described, but I also think that we um, expand and strengthen black institutions. And I think that we create um, other opportunities and places where the kinds of experiences that are rich and robust and multiracial and affirming of the principles of democracy can happen with our young people. Great. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I think that in a way we have to um, perhaps start all over again. Uh, affirmative action came about um, in a certain time period. Um, there were certain deals uh, over a period of time that were made to emphasize diversity. Uh, emphasize, um, le less emphasize uh, the hardships that people had suffered 
as a result of discrimination. So there were a lot of um, changes over the years, but I think that we have to go back to um, really looking at what will work in this in this current time period, because the reality is um, the the world is looking at us. The world is looking at us. And how are we responding? How are we treating black students? How are we treating Latinx students? How are we treating Asian American students? Um, I would say that the picture that is that is emerging is a mixed picture. Uh, because when you when you look at the anti-Asian violence, when you look at um a lot of foreign students, particularly from China, uh, n- not wanting to come to study here anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's an alarming development. Mm-hmm. And I think that we have to stand up for multiracial democracy. And we have to really work with our allies, uh, like the people on the call today, uh, to figure out what what might work, what might unite Americans to push forward. Um, you know, we have a lot of examples uh, in different sectors, but in this sector, uh, we we really have to come together. Stuart, that is a great segue to the first question from the audience, and thank you so much, uh, all of you, for the for your responses. But from Eola Dance at Black Lunch Table, uh, this is the question which I will throw open to the, the group. What are your recommendations for grassroots organizations and everyday people in mobilizing to rally support for affirmative action? Is continued dialogue effective? What other action is impactful considering the anticipated court decision? Well, sure. I mean, I, I, um, we have to decide uh, what we think we want the world that we live in, the democracy that we live in to look like. And um, we have to use our voices and make our demands based on that vision, not based on what uh, Chief Justice Roberts or Samuel Alito tell us democracy looks like from their perspective. Now, that doesn't mean that we are not also pragmatic and finding ways that, which is what I just alluded to in my response previously, um, to understand the period that we're in and to try to reach our goals using different pathways. But I think the the importance of grassroots activism is critical because it is the message that we're sending to the public about what we think is right, about what we think is the proper direction, uh, and about what this court is doing, which I think is important also. That is a critical part of um uh, uh strengthening and 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 um addressing our democratic failures we have to be able to see clearly this is not just a a debate um that we ping pong mm-hmm. back and forth do you like affirmative action or not the court's doing some very very aggressive um and um alarming things moving at a very brisk clip to create the world that they want we saw this in dobbs we saw uh, the abortion case, we see it in, in Bruin, the gun case, and we may yet see it in affirmative action. I wrote a piece in the New York Review of Books about the oral argument, the five and a half hour oral argument, as a way of um, as a way of insisting that, you know, this is the, our, our job is not just to count the win loss column, you know, five mm-hmm. votes for this and four votes for that. Our job is to put them to their paces, to force the debate and the conversation upon them to reveal the emptiness of the positions that they're staking out, to, be, to reveal the, um, the absence of factual information and data to, to support the positions that they espouse. We still have to speak truth to power. So I think it's vitally important for grassroots communities to continue to let their voices be heard. And I think it's just powerful for young people to talk about their desire to engage and learn across race, across class, and so on and so forth. That is incredibly powerful and lies at the heart of the democratic project. 
because the message that's coming from above, um, from so many in the political realm uh, and the media realm, is that that is not what they want. But for young people to be saying, this is what I want, this is my vision of what it means to be educated, is incredibly powerful. And that's what should be driving this conversation. It's why I alluded to earlier the absence of, of the voices of students of color in the early um, cases challenging affirmative action, that that set us on this course, the, 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 the squaring up between an aggrieved white applicant and a, and a majority white university means that this whole conversation about education and what it means to our democracy has just been happening between white people talking about power. Mm -hmm. So we've never had any choice but to be in that grassroots space, letting our voices be heard. And we can't stop that, um, even as we've been able to find ways to get our voices heard inside the courtroom on these cases. Um, we still have to be heard out in the community, in the streets, in the universities, for people to understand what young people want and what is the democracy we imagine for our future. Great. Thank you. And, and Melissa, this might be for you, though. I would invite anybody to respond to this one from Bruce Koff. In states that already prohibit race conscious admissions, affirmative action, what strategies, if any, uh, show promise for successfully, uh, I'll, I'll say, in helping with diversity, since Melissa, you already talked about how little uh, was accomplished in California. Is, is there any hope, basically, for race neutral alternatives? Sure. Um, you know, there was a lot that was made of the Texas 10% plan. So this was Texas's effort to deal with the question of race conscious admissions by reserving 10% of the slots at its flagship universities, the University of Texas at Austin and Texas A&M um, in College Station for the top 10% of each high school class. And the logic of this was that this was an ostensibly race neutral method. Um, Justice Ginsburg, in one of the dissents in, or one of the uh, separate opinions in Fisher one, and then Justice Kennedy um, reiterated it um, in Fisher two, noted that the reliance on the Texas 10% plan wasn't necessarily race neutral because Texas high schools really relied on residential segregation. And, and that's what sort of contributed to the diversity of the top 10% of these high schools. The high schools were neighborhood schools. And so there was incredible de facto residential segregation in Texas. So this was nominally facially race neutral, but race was obviously an undercurrent that contributed to the success of this plan. But you could have facially neutral efforts in that way. Um, other schools, like for example, diverse, uh, there is a diversity statement that students who apply to the University of California can elect to complete where they talk about how they might contribute to the diversity of the UC campuses. And that could be diversity, however you define that. And it can be considered as part of your admissions package. Um, so those are some ways, but again, I, I have to preface this. We don't know what aftermath of the Supreme Court decision will mean and it will mean for those kinds of measures. If it is the case, the court recognizes the top 10% plan or zip code segregation as too closely correlated with race, that may be verboten going forward. And maybe the fact that students can talk about race as part of a diversity statement would also be verboten. And instead, you have to talk about things that are race neutral. I mean, I think that would raise some really problematic First Amendment concerns. But I really want to emphasize, I think we are in uncharted territory at this point with the Supreme Court's decision and the offing. That could change the landscape entirely. Okay. Thank you. And from Rochelle Riley, uh, going to the question about court, the court of public opinion, uh, she's the director of arts and culture in the city of Detroit. Would affirmative action like reparations benefit from a different name? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a big believer in marketing. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, you know, as, as I've said, I actually think this is more race conscious admissions, um, at least in the context of these two cases. Um, you know, it's interesting. We've, we've been in this kind of uh, tussle on social media about the um, hijacking of the term woke by those on the far right. Um, I'm all for branding, and I think it's true that um, you know anything that sounds 
old timey and and not not like a success. Uh, it doesn't galvanize our communities, but we shouldn't, um, you know, lie to ourselves. Whatever we identify will be, you know, warped and distorted uh, in some way to mean something that it doesn't. Um, and if they can't figure that out, then they'll just flip it, you know, CEG reverse discrimination. Um, so th there's no there's no term that is impervious. But I think I would answer that really by um, going back to Stuart's question. I think we have to decide. What is our vision? What do we want? What is what? What do we think? Especially because going back to what I said at the very beginning of this discussion, we we have been herded back to this diversity argument. This is not the argument that we wanted to advance for affirmative action. This is what we were left with, and so now if we are at a point where what we are left with is going to be discarded by this Supreme Court in a million ways that would be entirely inappropriate, but nevertheless discarded then I feel herded back to talking about what I want um, and not talking about how I make my way around the remnants that have been left. And so to me, that's the conversations we should be having. We should be talking about what do we want admissions to look like? What do we think is the best educational environment? What do we think is an appropriate way to remedy the exclusion, um, the, the historical exclusion of uh, Black students and professors from these institutions? What do we think is the way, especially in the time of democratic crisis, to make the American university classroom an incubator for multiracial democracy? Like, let's build what we want um, rather than figure out how we can tinker around the edges of what the Supreme Court says this time, when we're already tinkering around what they said in 1979, uh, which, as I said, when I was in high school, was considered a failure. It was considered a lost case. Um, so I feel challenged in a positive way by this moment, not because I think great things you know, come initially out of this case, but if what it does is um, herd us back into um, a place where we are imagining more what we want, um, more than what we think we can get from the very narrow cramped vision of, of democracy that these folks have uh, advanced, then that's a good thing to, to get our juices going again and to get us thinking more creatively and more boldly and more long-term about how we use these resources because the university is a democratic resource um, and how these resources can best serve the kind of multiracial democracy that, that those of us, I'm sure, listening and on this call want. Okay. Yes, I agree that um, this is a time to think boldly, even though we're trying to be in a way on the defense. Uh, we have to think boldly because um, so many institutions in the United States are being challenged. Uh, we have to think boldly about what the path forward will be and how that will benefit the majority of Americans. There's 100 million Americans who live in financial insecurity. Uh, how do we address uh, them? So yes, uh, race conscious admissions for sure. Uh, but the idea of thinking boldly, of organizing with allies to think how to uh, move the agenda, uh, I think is absolutely important. Wonderful. Well, I, I think we're actually at time in our conversation. And I, I love the fact that we have, you have woven in realism with candor, with some optimism as well. Uh, so Sherilyn, Melissa, Stewart, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to everybody who joined in and was here by Zoom. We appreciate your asking questions and your commitment to having these types of discussions in the first place. That is so crucial to anything that happens uh, going forward. So thank you all for joining and I hope you come to the next Mellon event as well. And I think we're gonna sign thank off. You. Thank, thank you. you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.